Good morning. It's uh, the Lord's Day, and it's a beautiful day because it is the Lord's Day. Uh, the weather, of course, is beautiful as well, and that just is an added blessing. It's good to be here with you all today and to be able to share the Word of God. <clears throat> so, we're going to be talking about a topic that I think is so necessary today. Our God has called us to make disciples, and part of uh, being a disciple is to be faithful. Discipleship, of course, includes many characteristics. Faithfulness uh, to him is, of course, one of them. Availability, uh, certainly integrity of heart, uh, to be teachable, and to always be ready to serve him at a moment's drop uh, of notice is also, of course, key. But today, I want to talk about faithfulness. <clears throat> and I want to tell you that faithfulness is at the core of discipleship. And as uh, we will find out today, faithfulness is not something that is easy to come by, but is, it is nevertheless absolutely essential. Without faithfulness, there is no being a disciple of Jesus Christ. There is no being a follower of Jesus Christ. And some might correctly argue that without discipleship, there is no faithfulness, because we can't learn faithfulness outside of being trained by the Word of God through men and women who are willing to spend time training us and developing our life as disciples of Jesus Christ. And so to better understand this issue of faithfulness, it'll require us to consider three points. First of all, divine faithfulness. Second, the dynamics of faithfulness. And finally, the demands for faithfulness. So I'd like us to get started then with our first point, divine faithfulness. And we begin with divine faithfulness because God is faithful, because God is the divine source of faithfulness. God sets for us an example. He demonstrates for us the importance and the how-to of being faithful, and he reveals it to us in Scripture. God is revealed, in fact, as a faithful God in Psalm 89.8. There we read, O Lord God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Some of these verses that we'll be reading today are so precious, so deep, and I'd love to spend a lot of time on some of these verses, but just try to savor in and try to taste the beauty and the depth of these verses as we read them. So God is the source of all faithfulness, and he displays his faithfulness. He displays it daily as he shows it to us. He shows us his ceaseless loving kindnesses. And do you know why God does that? Well, because God's faithfulness is a great faithfulness. It is not faithfulness perhaps like yours or mine. It is far in excess of that, as Lamentations 3.22 and 23 so beautifully state. The Lord's loving kindnesses in ne indeed never cease. They never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. And then, of course, great is your faithfulness. What a beautiful hymn, right? Written with that same thought in mind. In fact, it is so great that it reaches to the skies. Have you ever stopped to think about how big faith, the faithfulness of God is? Well, we're told in the word that it reaches to the skies. We've talked to my grandchildren and, and I, I know my daughter and then uh, now one of our children have said basically the same thing. I love you all the way to heaven, all the way up there. That's how big their love, they say, is for us as grandparents. Well, God's faithfulness is like that as well. Psalm 38, 5, listen to this. Your kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Get that? Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Isn't that amazing? God's faithfulness reaches to the skies. God asks for us, is ready for us to call upon his faithfulness to be showed in our life. And not only so, but God's faithfulness is everlasting. It never dies out. It never quits. It never stops. God is always ready to demonstrate his faithfulness to us. Psalm 100, verse 5. <clears throat> there the psalmist writes this. The Lord is good. 
His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness is to all generations. To all generations. That is, it extends to all of the generations of man that will ever be. There will never be a time when God's faithfulness will not be available. There is nothing that God does that is not due to his faithfulness. There is nothing at all that God does that is not due to his faithfulness. The things he does, he does because he's faithful. Psalm 33, verse 4. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. Is our work done in faithfulness, or is it done out of duty? Is our work done out of faithfulness, or is it done because we have to? In, uh, in, in, I'm just getting ready to preach uh, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. And uh, there we're told uh, as pastors that we are not to do our work by compulsion, but with eagerness, with great joy, with great anticipation. Well, not only so, but since perfection is one of God's attributes, everything about him must be perfect, agreed? And so that would include his faithfulness. And this is exactly the way it is. God's faithfulness is perfect faithfulness. That's why we're told that it, his faithfulness never fails. It doesn't change. It doesn't vary. It doesn't uh, quit. Uh, Isaiah 25, 1. Here's how the prophet expresses it there. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name for you, listen to this, have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Wow, that's tremendous. That is absolutely incredible. Did you notice the phrase, you have worked wonders, Plans, plans formed long ago. Now we know that God chose us for salvation even before the end of the world. That's what Ephesians 1, 4 tells us, right? So that means that he had plans for us. Remember with Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you. And because he has had these plans for us, in his faithfulness, he preserves us. In his faithfulness, he preserves us. In uh, Psalm 31, 23, and so many of these verses you notice come from the Psalms because David had such a walk with God. He was a man whose heart was after God's own heart. But here we go, Psalm 31, 23. O oh, love the Lord, O oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully recompenses the proud doer. God preserves the faithful. So do we want to be preserved? We've got to be faithful. We've got to be faithful. Hence, in loving gratitude, we're to speak of God's faithfulness and his salvation. Because God is faithful, we need to talk about that. We need to tell people about God's faithfulness. In Psalm 40, verse 10, I have not hidden your righteousness within, excuse me, uh, I have, yeah, I have not hidden uh, your uh, righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindnesses and your truth from the great congregation. Absolutely fabulous verses. God is a divine source of faithfulness. So we must preach about God. We must preach about his faithfulness to believers. And we must proclaim his wonderful salvation to unbelievers. So they will then proclaim his faithfulness. In fact, it's precisely because of his faithfulness. It's precisely because faithfulness is such an important attribute that parents are to teach their children about God's faithfulness. Isaiah 38, 19 is a key verse on this point. <clears throat> uh, the living give thanks to you, as I do. A father tells his son about your faithfulness. A father tells his son about your faithfulness. See, we're to talk about God's faithfulness all the time, all the time. I have a friend who uh, is now retired from the Navigators, a gentleman by the name of Paul Drake, and uh, 
whenever you ask Paul how he's doing, he says this, that he says that God is faithful and he says, I am better than I deserve because he's talking about God's faithfulness to him. So God is faithful and we are to bear his image. That's why we're saved, right? That's what Romans 8, 29 says is that we were saved so that we could bear the image of Christ. And so if God is faithful, that means that part of our bearing Christ's image is that we are to be faithful as well. That's why to drive our life, to be faithful to him and to be faithful to the things that we need to be faithful. Now, let's focus our attention then on the dynamics of faithfulness. The dynamics of faithfulness. By the dynamics of faithfulness, I mean the basis or reason behind our faithfulness. Now, the reason that we are to be faithful is because of our faith in Jesus Christ. The reason that we are to be, the reason that we can be faithful is because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, faith is the Greek noun apistis, uh, which means persuasion or credence or moral conviction of some religious truth or truthfulness of God. And its verb form, pistuo, means to commit, means to entrust. It means to, to place uh, faith or confidence in. So in a practical sense then, to have faith means to align our desires with God's will. To align our desires with God's will. In other words, to want what God wants and to believe that he can accomplish what he desires to accomplish. Now a lot of folks think that prayer is all about getting God to do what we want him to do. Well, that's simply not true. Jesus teaches us to pray uh, in Matthew 6.10, your will be done. Not my will, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our faith is placed in the fact that God can do, will do what he wants to do. And what we want to do is to align our, uh, our faith on that, to get to know God so well, so deeply, that even when we pray, we can pray correctly and we can pray faithfully because we're praying according to what we know that God wants. Now, there's a very grave misunderstanding as to faith, and so I'd like to state two very uh, powerful truths about faith. And first of all, having enough faith is not a matter of how badly we want something. Okay, uh, having enough faith is not a matter of how badly we want something. And it's also not a matter of how much we feel that we want something to happen. That is not really having faith. Having faith is believing that God will affect change if such change is according to his will. And then too, it is not the amount of faith which matters, but in whom our faith is placed. In whom our faith is placed. So many times I hear people going to hospitals and they'll say, well, I have faith that God's going to heal you or lift you up out of this bed. How do you know that? You know that God has the power to do it, but do you, when you say, I have faith that God's going to do it, does that mean it's going to happen? No. But we still pray for that. We still pray to that end, right? But a lot of times we tend to give people false hope because, oh, well, so-and-so has faith. Well, no, it's not our faith that does it. It's the will of God that does it. So this is why Jesus said that we could move mountains with a a seed the size of a mustard seed, or with, a, with, with such little faith as the size of a mustard seed, Matthew 17, 20. So we shouldn't have faith in faith. We should have faith in God. So, reviewing then, faith, our faith, is in Jesus Christ. And that opens the door to our being faithful. But faithfulness doesn't come naturally to most of us believers. It's a real battle to be faithful, is it not? It's a real struggle. There's all kinds of opposition and just even our own flesh and doubt that lead us to doubt and to say, no, that's, that's not going to happen. No, that's, that's not good enough. No, that won't work. But we need to believe that our God is powerful to accomplish his will. So I guess the real question would be, what is his will? What does he want us to do?
But our will, or our deciding, rather, our deciding God's, what God's will is, should not be driven by our feeling, and it shouldn't be driven by our, by our circumstances, but it should be driven by the truths of the Word of God. Now, in Psalm uh, 37, verse 3, we read this, Trust and the, in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good, continues the verse. Dwell in the land. And then listen to this. Cultivate faithfulness. Cultivate faithfulness. Now, I'm not much of an agriculture person. I've always lived in the city and not out in the country somewhere. But to me, cultivate means work. Cultivate means get up in the morning before the sun rises and start working the land, whether you're doing it with animals or you're doing it with equipment, but work that land and turn it over and, and plant the seed and water the seed and take care of it so that, so that you, you spray it properly and you protect it from uh, 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 diseases and from little bugs and from the birds. And, and when the time comes, you go and you pick that, that grain or that fruit. So you cultivate. It's, it's hard, diligent work. That's faithfulness. So we're to cultivate faithfulness. We're to be intentional about being faithful. We're to be intentional about being faithful, understanding that everything around us would pull us away from being faithful. Everything draws us away from being faithful. Everything calls us to give up. That's why there's so many divorces in this country and around the world. People give up. I'm not happy with this person anymore. No, this isn't going to work. This marriage just doesn't work anymore. It can't happen. It can't be. We've tried too long. We've worked too hard. We've gotten nowhere. People give up when they're ill a lot of times. And they have serious diseases and they give up. And they don't want treatment. And they just want to give it up. People want to give up everywhere. Why do quit kids today quit school? Why do people leave their jobs? People get tired, they quit. But that's not what God has called us to. You see, we have to be intentional about being faithful. And we have to understand that there are things that, that war against our being faithful. And, and so what happens is when we, when we fall prey to that draw of being faithful, uh, of being unfaithful, then we fall into a lack of discipline and we fall into a pattern of destructive disobedience. And so the question is, how do we cultivate great godly faithfulness? How do we prevent our becoming faithless? Well, by developing, and we talked a little bit about this uh, this morning in Sunday school, by developing a habit of reading God's word. By developing the habit of meditating on it, of praying on it, based on, on, on the word of God itself, we develop and cultivate our faith by continuing to have sweet, dear uh, fellowship and accountability to the believers. And by evangelizing the lost every day. That's how we cultivate faithfulness. We do the things that God has called us to do. Because all of those things build habit, build discipline, build a love for God. And then when we see God start to work and answer our prayers, what happens? We become excited and we become joyful. And then that makes us become more faithful. And as we become more faithful, we work harder. And as we work harder, we see more fruit. And as we see more fruit, we become more faithful. So here's what we've learned thus far. God is faithful. And we cannot be faithful if we don't cultivate our faith in Jesus Christ by consistently doing those things that cause our faith to grow. But what are some of the things that Christians are demanded faithfulness in? What are some of the areas that demand faithfulness? Well, there's many things, of course, but just to name a few. To begin with, Faithfulness is first demanded for a spiritually, or for a spirit-filled life, for a spirit-filled life. And this is why faithfulness is part of the fruit of the spirit. Paul documents it for us in uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 saying, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. So, 
When we faithfully walk in the Spirit, it will result in our being made faithful, conformed to the image of faithful Christ. Second, faithfulness is demanded of us for accomplishing our stewardship. In Genesis 1, man was given the stewardship of the land and over everything in the land. But additionally, the Apostle Paul tells us that we believers are stewards with respect to the preaching of the gospel. And so it's demanded that we be found faithful stewards. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of his God, or of God, rather. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. So it is demanded that we be faithful in the preaching of the word of God, in the teaching of the message of salvation. Third, faithfulness is demanded of us for pleasing the Lord. For pleasing the Lord. Uh, Matthew uh, 25, 1, it says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Isn't that phenomenal? We become faithful in the little things. We'll be faithful in the big things. We won't be faithful in the big things unless we're faithful in the little things. Folks, we need to be faithful in the little things. We don't have to go after the big things. All we have to do is do the little things. Pray, read your word, study it, teach it, have fellowship, witness to people, you know, do the things that you need to do. Fourth, faithfulness is demanded uh, for living, for living. Psalm 26.3. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I have walked in your truth. Folks, we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful in our jobs. We need to be faithful to our families. We need to be faithful in, in our you know, participants in our community, faithful to our church, faithful to all of the things that form our everyday life. Fifth, faithfulness is de uh, demanded for enduring persecution. For enduring persecution. The, G the Church of Jesus Christ has always been persecuted. They've always been attacked. And that hasn't changed and that won't change. And so knowing that, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, and uh, he tells Timothy there, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, I'm suffering too. You suffer with me. I'm right there with you, Timothy. You're not alone. Be faithful. Learn to be faithful like I am. Are any of us here today suffering? Are any of us here today going through struggles? Are any of us going today through quandaries? Yes, we are. Do any of us have questions as to God's will? Yes, we are. Are any of us, any of us struggling with difficult issues? Yes, we are. And Paul is saying, struggle with me. I'm telling you, struggle with me. And you ought to turn to your neighbor and say, you struggle with me. We'll struggle together. We'll be faithful together. Sixth, faithfulness is demanded for the fulfillment of the great commission of making disciples. First, uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust these to faithful men. And by the way, women too, who will be able to teach others also. Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Folks, we need to be faithful to the Great Commission. I dare say that sometimes we forget about the Great Commission. And we get so caught up in the everyday pressures and activities of life that we forget about the importance uh, of, of preaching the Word of God and the reason that we're here on this earth. Now you and I are in the work of reproduction. We're in the work of multiplication. That's why churches exist, to glorify God and to grow his kingdom. So we're to reproduce ourselves and others and thereby multiply believers. And so there you have it. Faithfulness is an absolutely inextricable part of your being and my being and all of us being 
a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. So if we're to be effective disciples and disciple makers, we must be faithful. We must be faithful to the end. We must be faithful to do the things that are according to God's will, particularly those that impact on the fulfillment of the Great Commission of making disciples. I was relating this morning that when I was in high school, I had a wrestling coach who would always call out to me. And he would always say, Louis, because my first name is Luis, and so he would say, Louis, don't quit. Don't quit, Louis, don't quit. And all I could hear the coach uh, yelling at me was, don't quit, Louis, don't quit. And I'd be out there in the middle of the mat and the crowd's yelling and I'm working as hard as I can. And the guy is better and stronger than me and I'm trying as hard as I can. And Louis better not quit because Louis's going to get his head chewed off if he does. So Louis didn't quit. And in fact, that lesson is stuck with Louis for the rest of his life. And Louis still hasn't quit. In fact, Louis was never pinned on the wrestling mat in high school or at SDSU because coach would always yell, don't quit, Louis, don't quit. And I would dare say that God, our greatest coach, is saying, don't quit. Don't quit. Be faithful. Father, today we pray that you would teach us to be faithful even as you, faithful God, are faithful. And that you would remind us of all of the things that you've done, the things that you are doing, and the things that you've promised to do for us as individuals, as families, as a church, as a community. And so, Father, we just pray that you just bless us now. And again, build faithfulness into our heart that we may walk uprightly before you and others in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.